Okay, so Rabbi Lynn, this is such a pleasure to have Rabbi Lynn be with us. She is a visionary. She's a visionary rabbi, but she, I think she was a visionary person before she was a rabbi. And she's a human rights advocate. She's a master storyteller, educator, and visual artist. You'll see in her room around her, the walls are covered with her work. Next year will be her rabbinic jubilee year, which means she's been at this for a long time. And actually, she was one of the first women to be a rabbi, ordained rabbi. So it's really an honor to have her here with us. She was a founding mem member of the Rabbinic Council at JDP. She's a board chair of Interface Movement for Human in Integrity, organizing team member of Grassroots Reparations Campaign, and founder and director of Backyard Michigan. She is, in her own words, a very funny person. Those are and my words. <laughs> those are her very words. And you will find out about Rabbi Lynn's radical spin on Hanukkah tonight. And that is her spelling as well. Please welcome. And Rabbi here Lynn. we go. <laughs> It is uh, really wonderful to be here. Um, thank you so much. And I know I put too much in, into this time and um, I honor all of you and happy Hanukkah. I'm just uh, going to begin. Nimane beta shrina. Nivane beta shrina, Nivane beta shrina, Vim hera beyameyenu. May we build the house of Shechina. Let us build the house of Shechina. Let us build the house of Shekhinah quickly in our day. I am Miriam, mother of Nathaniel and Savta of Laila Sivan. And I am daughter of Sivia, daughter of Bessie, daughter of Delia, daughter of Jenny, daughter of Henrietta, who settled here on Turtle Island in 1839. They came from Germany. They founded the 10th oldest Shul on Turtle Island on Lehigh land in Eastern Pennsylvania. I am their daughter. And we give thanks to the lands that we are settled upon here. If we are guests on Turtle Island. And we share with each other, we invite each other to share the lands we are settled on. I am settled on Ohlone land here in the Bay Area, and I drink from the Mokalumne River, the waters which have, which give everyone life here in the Bay Area. And we shine a light and pray that, and hope and work that our actions here tonight are for the sake of reparations and justice and love for each other so we can keep building a better world. And we light these lights 
And if you have Hanukkah lights, I invite you to light. I made these candles and I'm a little short on the shamish. So I'm gonna be the, sh the shamish and uh, light these three. And you can argue, do you light from here over, from here back? Who knows? Here we go. And feel free in the chat to dedicate these candles this third night uh, to someone or people or place that you're holding in your heart that you would like to shine the light of justice and healing and reparations upon. Hanerot, Hanerot. Hanerot halalu, Hanerot, Hanerot, Hanerot halalu, Anu madlikin, Anu madlikin, Hanerot halalu. Tonight, we invite each other to write in the chat what Hanukkah means to you. And as you write in the chat what Hanukkah might mean to you, I would like to share with you um, things I've been thinking about for a long time. And I'm calling this a Hanukkah rewrite. First, the Hanukkah rewrite <coughs> is according to the principles of the Jewishness, I guess you could say, the practice, that the principles that I practice, which is not a denomination, but it's principles called Shomeret Shalom. And the foundation of these values is keeping a practice going. It's not so much a belief system as it is trying to strive toward certain values of living. And my own idea of this, you know, comes from the idea that we have this amazing tree of life, the menorah, the original menorah, seven branches to create sacred days of creation in which one of those gives us back our human dignity and that is Shabbat. And this ancient practice of keeping our dignity and ceasing from work and refreshing ourselves and repairing ourselves, these seven have become a frame. This idea of seven has become a frame for the values we need in order to be at peace the awareness of interconnectivity, that's the echad of the Shema, the one, which means interconnectivity, hityahdut, and active love, and the sacredness of human dignity above all else, gadol kvod habriyut, and the pursuit of equity, Sedic, sedic to doth. And the practice of reparations or chuva, which is the payment that we have accrued, the debt we have accrued for systemic harms. And non cooperation, active non cooperation with cis forms of systemic violence which is cited in Hanukkah, lo b'chayel, not with military might, lo b'koach, and not with force of arms. 
Ela Boruach, with the spirit of active nonviolence. And finally, to strive not to benefit or profit from the fruits of violence, al tikane. And so these seven principles of a Shomeret Shalom become the lens through which I filter the holidays and the narratives. And so I would like to, wanted to start from there because our holy days, our narratives and our practices have to be allies in the work of repair, of creating, as Dr. Dave Raglan says, creating a culture of repair, not contrary to it or fueling the opposite, which is the work of domination and systemic harm. So the Hanukkah rewrite falls into that map. And the first piece is a gender rewrite. The second, a rabbinic rewrite of the Maccabean myths. And the third, a rewrite of the Zionist mythology. Obviously tonight, I don't have time to share with you the story, the history of how Hanukkah came to be. But I will tell you the story that always touched me when I began to read through the four books of the Maccabees and then learned the folk tales told about and around Hanukkah from ancient times to the present, that it turned out that Hanukkah had more stories told by women about women than any other ceremonial time. Traditionally, women have performed the difficult tasks of hosting holidays, the physical tasks of cooking and cleaning and and preparing the clothes and decorating and organizing the household and inviting guests and managing the economics of the holiday and family dynamics. And there are many stories that reflect dissatisfaction with this <laughs> and the use of Hanukkah as a time to create sacred space where women did not have to work. And there's a very old joke that speaks of this. The word Hanukkah can be sliced up in Hebrew to mean Hanu, we came to rest, Ka, here, which is also the 25th, Chafhe. And it is the first night of Hanukkah, the 25th. And women said, yes, we came to rest by stopping work and divorcing our husbands. Oh. <laughs> so this, this is kind of an old joke that goes with a long story that speaks to the resistant spirit and the articulation of what it means to resist rape and sexual violence and patriarchy and the assault that comes with that. So, there is a story that is a different story than the origin tale, which is about Hannah, who is said to be a sister to Judah and the four other brothers. And this story comes out of a real experience of women who suffer under the rule of the lords of many lands who could take possession of a bride, assert control of a woman's body and claim for sexual conquest. Marriage has that tradition, can have that tradition within the community and it can be come with empire and war as we know. And so this story comes about as Hannah the Maccabee who was not ready to accept her fate 
She refuses to consent to such treatment, but she knew she could not resist alone. In the tradition of the five daughters of Zlafhad, Hannah gathered her sisters around her. On her wedding day, with the community gathered around, she walked up to the chuppah and ripped her wedding dress to shreds with a knife she had tied to her waist until she was naked. She stood defiantly in front of the crowd. Everyone gasped. Hannah's Kohenet sisters rose up and formed a circle around her as she spoke these words. Community of Israel, enough. No more sexual violence against us. Dedicate yourselves to our safety and self-determination. Everyone, rise up. Shine a light on freedom from sexual violence, from trafficking, from abuse. Is it not written, Elohim created all of us in their divine image? And is it not written, whoever saves one life saves a world entire? I am a world entire. Each of you is a world entire. Let us make each other feel safe in this entire world together. And with those words, the Maccabees rose up and took back the temple in Jerusalem. Now that's another kind of story, is it not? <laughs> and it is part of a long tradition of stories that are told from the real physical experience of gendered violence. And there is a beautiful uh, expression of this in North Africa called Hagabanot, Festival of Daughters, Eid, Eid al-Banat in Arabic, uh, in Jewish Arabic, which falls on the new moon of Tevet, another holiday which women started and claimed. And the seventh day of Hanukkah, Jewish women in the communities of North Africa go to the synagogue, take out the Torah, put their hands on the scrolls and pray for the health of their daughters. Families give gift to their daughters, pass down female inheritance and host reconciliation ceremonies among girls who are quarreling, people who are quarreling followed and there's dances to do that. There's ritual dances to do that followed by a host of other forms of dancing and dance tradition. Hagabanot was a time to resource daughters with material gifts that will help them survive and to tell stories about how we use our clever wit to outsmart the patriarchy. And so people have told the story of Judith, which is also too long to tell tonight but is essentially about cutting off the head of militarism and patriarchy, putting it in a basket and sticking it in the archives. We're done with it. We want to be done with it. And so Hanukkah has this counter, this alternative narrative, which is, which is deep and long and rich that can help us develop a culture of non-cooperation and resistance to all forms of militarism and nationalism and racial purity, ideas of racial purity, which have, have come to um, be part of in the narratives of and the holy days of and the social relationships that accrue in our time among Jewish people and others. And so as we sing Hanukkah Linda está aquí, ocho candelas para mí, as we eat pastelicos with almond and honey, as we munch on our latkes, 
we think that the we 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 remember that we are celebrating a holiday which focuses on the oil, which is the rabbinic rewrite of the militarism of the Maccabean dynasty, who were so disliked that literally because they put <laughs> the they brought the priesthood and the kingship together in one um person and they were so disliked that people threw etrogs at the head of the Judean dynasty during Sukkot because a dynasty depends on militarism and so the rabbis rewrote Hanukkah by decentering militarism of the Maccabees and their dynastic trappings and created fabricated hundreds of years later, a different story altogether. My Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah? It comes, becomes about the Kohanim and the Kohanot not finding oil when the temple was taken back, except there's a small amount that can burn the seven branch menorah for perhaps a day, but it lasts long enough, eight days, until they can remake the oil. Well, this tiny Talmudic story, this tiny Talmudic Iraqi Jewish story, Babylonian story, practically does not really mention the Maccabees. It is about cultural resistance and being a minority people and using this idea that Hanukkah also means education. So what is the force more powerful that the rabbis assigned as the uh, verse to read on Shabbat, not by military might or mayhem, <coughs> not by force of arms, but by these other values that are a force more powerful. And these are not passive values. These are values when we put them into, into action, we can create sanctuaries. We can begin to build out sanctuary for well being. In our own time, when we look at the miracle of the oil, we cannot consider the miracle of the oil without considering the current day assault on Palestinian grown olive trees and the thousands upon thousands of trees cut down to make way for Jewish only settlements. At, in a similar way here in California, when we learn that when the Spanish empire brought came to California in search of gold and destroyed two thirds of California live oak, which completely disrupted the ecology of place in which the entire ecosystem and peoples thrived. This is what happened with Palestinian people and Jews specifically target. Someone has to mute. Okay, Jews specifically target olive trees to destroy Palestinian culture. And so <laughs> the disconnect between the miracle of oil that we celebrate and the destruction of Palestinian of thousand year old trees, which I have seen with my eyes and what that means and what we are doing comes to look at the rabbinic critique of militarism and apply it to Zionism. It says when the Maccabees entered the temple, they found eight iron spears, which they threw into the ground and kindled lights upon them. This turning swords into plowshares is the opposite of what Zionism is remembering right now. 
And so we ask ourselves, what does it mean to increase the light today? How do we support resistance to militarism today, to Israeli state and civic militarism? How do we take up our BDS dreidel? You can make one too. And spin it, spin the story in such a way that we upend the Zionist vision of Hanukkah, which has become so much a part of Jewish life. And first, we have to realize, as we look at the idea that Zionism is, is racism, is unpacking Zionist ideology from the European perspective in that it became compatible and was inspired by ideas of limpieza de sangre, purity of blood. Zionism has this idea, adopted this idea, which is part of Western society that impurity and purity are best understood, now I'm quoting, as an assessment of particular phenomena in terms of what is imputed as self-identity that has a lot to do with qualitative homogeneity and correspondence with some mythic, mystic, imputed essence. A citizen is taken by national discourses to be pure if they are in some sense the same as other members of the nation. And they share something. And then other people have proximity or distance to this essence. And this, my friends, is really what Zionism is all about. And we see it literally in the separation wall. The separation wall is actual and also emblematic of the idea of Zionist purity that literally some people have to be put behind a fence. And this <laughs> is so distasteful given our own, given the length of Jewish history and the experience of ghettos and that it, it is kind of unbelievable. It is actually a culture of despair. This is a culture of despair. The only universal thing about purity and impurity is its use as a weapon which sees the other people as a problem. We cannot support a vision of Hanukkah based on Maccabean military victory or some purity of oil without understanding what it means in our own time. Certainly, early Zionists rejected all other holidays pretty much except for a couple of minor holidays really, Tu B'Shvat to use literally to plant trees in Israel and take over the land. It's, it, it was a vision of taking over the land. And Hanukkah, which had uh, different perspectives depending on whether you were a revisionist or you were part of the labor movement. But in both of these, there was this idea that Zionists blamed traditional Judaism as passive and non-resistance and being soft and blaming traditional culture. 
and reimagined a new Jew. Literally, during that time, there were groups called Bir Yonim, he-men. And so there was a kind of division, a bifurcation of the old and the new based on this concept of military resistance as a force more powerful. And that completely flipped the script on a traditional sense of resistance that our power is in communal organizing, in the steady keeping of stories and narratives and sacred times and sacred pauses, which help us remember how we are rooted and in what we want to be rooted. And we must be rooted in values that human dignity is sacred across all borders. Therefore, Zionist narrative and the practice it has led to cannot stand in any measure. There is no real good Zionism. All of the fruits of Zionism have led to massive dislocation cultural assault, physical assault, and so many different types of oppression the, in micro detail that the only lights that Hanukkah can symbolize is a reflection that we can create transformation only through a pathway of creating a culture of despair, a culture of repair and not a culture of despair by repaying the debt that we owe through acts of reparation and shuva to Palestinians starting today, starting today. This is not a future, this is now. This is what we must do now. And each of us will find our way, but we need to do it collectively. And so these lights of Hanukkah, every light that we light, as we're increasing the light, we plant ourselves in the practice, in the practice of women's idea that Hanukkah begins with safe bodies. Hanukkah must begin by dedicating ourselves to cultures of consent that create safe body spaces. And the rabbinic idea that there is tremendous fear and fierceness in the practice our ancestors have given us, which is about honoring human dignity, our attunement to the seasons and to time and to peace with our neighbors and to constantly thinking, what does that mean if we apply it today? We have always been a culture of rewrite. We cannot uh, take this Zionist idea, um, quote, that Hanukkah is an ancient festival, but a modest one. The festival of the Hasmoneans is a new holy day. This is a Zionist idea, but full of high spirits and popular gaiety. What was Hanukkah? For the miracles, the lighting of the little candles at home, potato pancakes, and playing cards for the, for the adults, spinning top for the toddlers. And what is Hanukkah now? The festival of the Hasmoneans, a holiday filled with cheering, a big national holiday, which is celebrated by the Jewish people in all its dispersions, 
with parties and speeches, songs and ballads, hikes and parades, <laughs> big torches. This is our festival of the Hasmoneans as it is today. So this transference to a nationalistic holiday that celebrates militarism and a kind of a purity must be rejected altogether. Today, Hanukkah has, like many things in Israel, have become colonial sources of colonial entertainment for tourists, as well as um, to inspire purism, uh, purity, national purity, and a kind of racism. The annual Hanukkah torch relay, pretty um, kind of scary, marks the beginning of the holiday in Israel. People line the road from the city of Modi'in on set on uh, stolen land outside Tel Aviv to the Western Wall in Jerusalem, passing a burning torch from hand to hand. The torch then lights the giant Hanukkah menorah at the Western Wall. So this is on a tourism site and it, it is completely without context and it also perverts the meaning of the kind of resistance that the rabbis and other ancient Israelites were doing under the time of Roman occupation in which it was enough to put a small symbol of your presence in your window. And I think of the beautiful olive trees I've seen painted um, in Palestinian towns and villages that say, we are still here. We can no longer celebrate Hanukkah without first finding a way to incorporate actual reparations in our celebrations. And this may mean that your Hanukkah is a series of eight giveaways <laughs> where you are in the process of gifting. And the gifting is paying the debt that we owe to Palestinians. And whether this is the return of land or through um, supporting various um, efforts and projects, uh, D, uh, looking at your own investments and decoupling yourself, you know, sort of removing yourself from, from webs of um, systemic violence that are causing harm. There, and JVP certainly is an amazing um, expression of this passion for a renewed and rededicated not just Hanukkah, but Jewish life that affirms life and gives back land. And this I, I will close. For me, Hanukkah, this, the recelebration of uh, the miracle for me would be the repatriation of land to Palestinians. And giving back land as a form of reparations um, would, would be for me a fulfillment, a miracle of the Torah of nonviolence. That would be the real miracle of people, you know, all of us waking together and demanding that return of the land. And I pray and will continue to act for this time and to honor the uh, Palestinians I have known who have been so graceful in accompanying me in this journey of reparations um, to, to bear more weight of the burden. And um, may this come to pass quickly and in our day. And um, yes, here's my. So as we spin our dreidels um, and we 
repatriate land uh, to Bethel, to all the nine cities and the many villages and, and um, the tent of nations and we get rid of the borders and we take down the separation wall and we open up the springs and all of that. Um, may we live in such a way that um, we bring this to pass as quickly as we can. And so now I'm gonna turn on my chat and also rely on you if there are questions. Um, and I, I, want, I want to encourage you if you want to, you know, receive a monthly scroll, for instance, from the tour of nonviolence, um, you can find my Patreon page. And for very little, I just keep sending you once a month, uh, things to read about related to um, putting the different aspects of uh, the Torah of nonviolence and Shomer and Shalom together. So uh, any, any reflections? So what, what did this mean to you? <laughs> um, that's always a really important question. Um, what landed for you? Um, what questions did it raise in you? Um, what will you take with you? And um, I, I invite you to you know, put it in the chat if you'd like. And or if you have, you know, questions. Um, or you want to hear more about something? Rabbi Lynn, you had um, mentioned that possibly at the end you would share a story. And I was fearful that we wouldn't get to the story, but it seems like we have a few minutes. Um, and unless I'll, I'll mind the chat and see if there's a question that comes up. And meanwhile, you can share a story. Yes. Um, so many stories. I love all the stories that make fun of Alexander the Great at Hanukkah. And including he meets Amazons and he meets villagers. I mean, he, he, he's the first actually great, not great, but he's the first general. And so he, after pillaging, Gaza, he marches on to Jerusalem, which is at the time a very small town of mostly uh, priestly families. Long, long ago, so long ago, it might not have happened, Alexander the Great entered the ancient city of Malchit Sedek, the first person of that place who created a vision of people coming together. And Alexander the Great said, I am Alexander the Great, conqueror of the world. If you answer my questions, I will not destroy your city. Here's my first question, who is wise? The Kohenot answered with one voice, those who can see the effects of their actions on others. And who is a hero, inquired Alexander. One who can conquer their own fear. And who is rich, said Alexander, those who remain satisfied with what they have, which is enough to share with others, said the Kohanim. Alexander persisted. Well, how can a person acquire good friends? By trying not to have power over others, said the Kohanim. Alexander became angry. That's not true. I have more power than anyone in the whole world. And I have the power to help, insisted Alexander. 
but the sages remain silent. Well, who is wisest among you? The Kohanim bowed their heads. We are all equal, equally wise in our own way. The story goes on. For a long time, too long to be able to tell you the whole story now. <laughs> but in this telling of the story, the Kohanim are able to express the traditional values of rabbinic tradition, which is to build a sanctuary wherever you are. This is the philosophy of the Mishkan, the place we put our tent and open it, create a safe place so all can enter, everyone in the light. That's why we need a Zionist rewrite or rewrite of Hanukkah without Zionism. Any questions arise? Well, people just want another story, I suspect. It seems that there's a, a really uh, a lot of gratitude, Rabbi Lynn, for these teachings. Um, and just uh, kind of awe about the image of the miracle of reparations to Palestinians, Beth Harris wrote this. The, this resonates for me, and I'm going to practice it for the rest of Hanukkah. Thanks for the Torah of nonviolence. Thank you, Beth, for writing that. Yeah, may, may all of us, um everywhere on this earth, honor indigenous peoples and honor um, uh, the way that leads us to living together um, in such a way that we don't despoil every part of life around us. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate so much. Um, people can donate to JVP too as a, uh, a Hanukkah gift. This, this weekend I get to tell Herschel and the Goblins and other such wonderful stories, <laughs> but not tonight. Rabbi Lynn, would you put in the chat your uh, Patreon page? Uh, I know that there are a lot of people who would love your scrolls. They just, besides being so rich in information and stories, they're beautiful. Um, yeah. Because Rabbi Lynn is an amazing artist and gifts that uh, with each scroll. And um, there's other teachings. Um, could you mention where else you're going to be? Um, uh, the reparations class that you'll be doing with Sedek, uh Chicago soon. Um, yes, so on, on the thirteenth. Is it on the thirteenth? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm, reading, I'm looking yeah. at my my old school calendar. Mean, yes. Meanwhile, I'll make a pitch about the other uh, events that we have this week. As um, this is the Hanukkah against apartheid, and uh, tomorrow night, you can also, if you go to jvp.org, diagonal slash Hanukkah, or Hanukkah hyphen against hyphen apartheid, uh, you'll find all of the events and registration links there. But tomorrow night is how to talk to your neighbor about Palestine. This is a training with JVP action. And then on Thursday night, Rabbi Lynn mentioned the new moon um, celebration, Rosh Chodesh. Uh, we have 
JVP Chavara Network has a monthly Rosh Chodesh celebration, and this month falls on, in Hanukkah. Uh, and afterwards, you can stay on. We have a celebration and anti-apartheid on it. Saturday night, there's going to be artists against apartheid with an amazing lineup of uh, spoken word artists, dancers, musicians, theater, um, including Yiddish uh, literature. So I really invite you all to come to that. And Monday night, uh, Sunday is a deconstructing an Iraqi, the, the political history of an Iraqi dish that was then um, co-opted by Israeli Zionists and saying it was an Israeli dish when it's really an Iraqi dish. So if you like cooking, you can cook with us. Check that out. So you'll have the ingredients ahead of time. And then Monday night, there's a fabulous party with JVP New York City, uh, a benefiting um, Palestinian organization. So there's a lot to do. We, and our work is hardly done. Um, part of our work this week is learning, celebrating, being together in this community. I want to thank you so much, Rabbi Lynn, for being here with us, for these teachings, for creating this beautiful sacred space. Thank you. Thank you to Lisbeth, JVP, to Jack for doing this amazing, um, just keeping up with everything, really great. And for all of you for being here. Thank you so much. Hanukkah Alegre. Thank you all. Have a beautiful evening. Melissa, do you want to stay on for a minute? Sure. Okay. Here's a beautiful okay. that one. That's what we yeah. are.